Hi, my name is Eric Linus. I'm from uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center uh, Planetary Environments Lab. I'm going to talk to you today um, about some machine learning we applied to our instrument that's going to Mars on the ExoMars mission landing in 2023. Um, this was a sort of proof of concept effort um, and there's a lot to be learned I think from what from this mission uh, can be applied to future missions. Uh, I did this work all, all with Victoria Duplin, who's really done a superb job uh, the, with the machine learning. Okay, <clears throat> what I'm talking about first is the coming flood of data, and then what I see is our arc in this flood, which is science autonomy. Uh, and then I'm going to present our what we did for MoMA, our instrument on ExoMars how we apply machine learning and, uh, and finish with the lessons learned, which I think could be applied to just about any space mission. So in the Planetary Environments Lab and really everywhere uh, in NASA, our main product is data. That's what we return. There are some sample return missions, but the vast majority of what we do is we return data and nothing else. No rover has come back from Mars yet, um, and the samples won't come back from, from there uh, for maybe 10 years. Um, but this is going to be a problem. <laughs> In the five years between 2021 and 2025, more data will be generated than the sum of all data ever created. So pretty much as of today, everything that you have on your hard drives is just going to be a drop in the bucket compared to what's going to be generated in the next five years. This is not a tsunami. This is not a flood that will recede. This is a flood with a continuously rising tide. Um, Earth science, uh, their archives are preparing for this huge onslaught of data. They're building up their capacity to deal with this many many petabytes of data I and mean, we're gonna have to start thinking about what comes after peta now um, but what about the corresponding increase in data analysis are we going to have a hundred times as many scientists looking at this data I don't think so um, in planetary which is mainly where I work um, we have a similar problem um, although our missions are very limited in bandwidth uh, so the actual data returned to Earth isn't like Earth missions. Uh, our instruments continue to generate more and more data. And so our problem is even more acute, perhaps, in Earth science, whereas we're generating more data on these uh, planets than we can send back. Uh, the, the Nobel Prize may be left there because we can't send everything back. Uh -huh. So the solution to both these problems, the, the planetary and the earth science and, and probably every other type of space science, is science autonomy. This is the arc that we need to climb into uh, to try to survive the flood. Um, by science autonomy, I'm talking about software that intelligently analyzes and filters science data to identify the compelling results. To, not to make, not to write the paper, but to point the scientist in the direction that this is the interesting data. Look here, among this haystack, there's a needle over here in this part. Take a closer look. So, I'm going to talk about what we did for our instrument on ExoMars. It's the Mars Organic Molecule Analyzer. Um, it's a mass spectrometer. Uh, it'll be landing on Mars in 2023. Um, it's representative of, of a lot of science instruments. Uh, NASA science instruments in two ways. One is the data is unique. There, there's no commercial equivalent to MoMA. There are similar ones, but they're not equivalent enough that we can apply the data set from a commercial instrument to the MoMA data. They're too different. They're not similar enough. Uh, second of all is we don't know what we were looking for. If you look at machine learning applications, a lot of them they know what they're looking for. They know specifically, I'm looking for this, this, or this. In this case, we, we really we might not be sure what we're looking for. Um, so we have to be very careful uh, that our intelligence doesn't throw out the key anomalous, apparently anomalous data that actually is the most interesting thing. Um, okay, a little bit about MoMA. Um, it's a, it's a dual-mode mass spectrometer with a gas chromatograph and a laser desorption mode. Um, ExoMars has a drill which can go two meters down. Um, so 
the moment is searching for, for past and present life uh, through a molecular analysis of these solid samples. And by the way, this is a really similar instrument um, that will be going on a Dragonfly mission to Titan. Uh, so what we learn here could, could be applied there. Um, MoMA is an ion trap. An ion trap is a really flexible mass spectrometer. It actually holds the ions inside and then you can manipulate them and read them out in ways to optimize your measurement. So when you see something, you can say, oh, that's very interesting. And what if we zoom in on this area here or do this or manipulate the ions this way? So the scientists with an ion trap have a lot of choices to make run experiments. Um, so our long-term goal for an instrument like this is to do that analysis on board. We, take, we get a mass spectrum, we analyze it, uh, we decide if it's compelling enough to send to Earth. Uh, either way, we look at that, the, the, the instrument itself looks at the data and decides how it can tune itself, how it can optimize the measurement, what was interesting in that mass spectrum, how can we tweak it to, to get more information. Um, that's our long-term goal. Um, even if we had such a functional algorithm at this point, it wouldn't be possible on MoMA because the, the limitations of the CPU in space environments. And, and MoMA was designed over 10 years ago, so the processors uh, are, are limited. Um, but what we can do in the short term is what we're calling the customers also liked interface. Um, uh, this is going to be applying machine learning to a to our, our engineering, our ground data that we've collected over the years uh, and provide an interface to the scientists so when they get a new spectrum from Mars, something they've never seen before, it will look through everything it's seen and say, hey, scientists, this reminds me of these experiments we've done on Earth before. This might be this or that. It points them in a certain direction. Um, and hopefully that will uh, speed up the time it takes them to tune the parameters. They only have uh, perhaps 24 hours um, to make decisions about how to adjust parameters for the next experiment. So we're hoping, uh, we believe that our, our customers also liked uh, interface will, will speed up that um, analysis of the data. Our approach, uh, there was four stages to our approach to the machine learning. One is collecting the data. Uh, I'll go over that in a bit. It's, it, this is a problem uh, everyone's going to have, every machine learning problem has, is, is getting your data and getting a nice data set. Uh, the second part, we, we cluster the data. We use a machine learning algorithm to cluster the data and sort of get get rid of data that isn't going to be useful uh, in the next step, which is, which is training a supervised um, system. In this case, we're using a neural network. Uh, uh, and then finally, we provide a user interface with our, our customers also liked uh, view. Okay, the data we got is from the MoMA engineering test unit, the ETU. Uh, it's been a workhorse. It's been running for several years now. Uh, over 300 different solid samples have been run through it. Um, over 60,000 mass spectra, LDMS mass spectra alone are, are, have been collected. Uh, we have no data from the flight model of MoMA because we never will want to present any organic material to it. We only have calibration data from the flight MoMA because uh, we don't want to contaminate it. Uh, but it is similar enough that we believe that, the, that what we learn from the ETU will, will work for flight. Um, the other thing was every mass spectra in the ETU has been recorded in a database with metadata. It was really key to what we did. We were meticulous about recording everything. Um, so we chose of the 300 some samples that have been tested there, we chose 70. Uh, this is showing the relative amounts. Some we have more and some we have less of. Uh, and we have to deal with that in our data. Um, there are two main problems with our ATU data, which are going to be problems for most instruments. Um, a lot of the data from the engineering unit is not flight-like. Uh, it was a non-flight-like configuration at the time, um, and if we use that data in our, our supervised learning system, it would just throw it off because the data is not flight-like. Uh, second is after we remove that data, uh, the data set was kind of small uh, for machine learning applications. With machine learning, the more data, the better. So we not quite enough data. So how do we deal with this? Um, uh, one way is we just simply removed obviously bad data. Uh, say there was very low signal or very, very high signal. Either case, we might throw that out. Uh, we also use these unsupervised methods to cluster the data. 
uh, and we were successfully able to, to select a cluster that had the most useful science data. Uh, and third, we, we, we grouped the samples into to categories. So instead of 70 samples, we have six to eight categories of samples. Uh, so we chart the, taught the neural networks for both the individual specific samples and also to identify uh, the categories. Uh, another thing we're working on now, uh, we're using dimensionality reduction, uh, such as UMAP, um, and we can use it to actually generate artificial spectrums similar to, to real spectra. So, so each of these dots represents a two-dimensional view of uh, much, much higher dimensional data, but you can select a data point on there and you can generate a mass spectrum that's similar to the nearest dots on this, this plot. So we could actually fill in areas uh, of this and generate the spectra for that. So that would increase our data volume. Okay, so uh, that's we talked about generating the data, getting the data from the ETU and cleaning it up. Uh, the second thing is clustering. So we apply this clustering technique. We tried a bunch of different algorithms listed here, eight to 10 algorithms we tried. Um, and, and to determine which one was working best, we had workshops with the scientists. So the data scientists and the scientists sat down together we wrote some software to help visualize, and they chose which were the best clustering algorithms and which which uh, clusters were, were most interesting, and that was really effective. Um, third, after we've we've got our unsupervised after our, uh, we've clustered the data, we take the best clusters and we use it to train uh, a network. Uh, we tried a bunch of different unsupervised algorithms. Um, and it quickly became apparent that neural networks were the best approach, and we've actually written our own uh, neural network, uh, developed our own neural network to do this. Uh, and finally, we implemented a user interface uh, uh, with the customer's also liked view. So uh, here we have in this middle plot a, a, a new mass spectra potentially, and then below are the similar mass spectrums, uh, and then a table showing the category and the sample from its history that it, it believes is, is the best match and also the score of that match. You know, was, it, was it 90% or, or 20% uh, to give the scientists a sense of how good this match is. Uh, so some key findings. Um, there's a lot more detail I could talk about how we implement it, but I'm running out of time here. Um, the data set from the ETU is not ideal for machine learning. This will be the case for every instrument that goes to space. Um, things we can do is we can make a testing plan early on specifically designed for training neural networks. Uh, we had kind of a hodgepodge of data that was used to, to calibrate the instrument and to determine its limits of detection. Uh, it wasn't really a, a wide spectrum of, of information that would help train a, a system. The other thing is to carefully record the metadata and, and the science data together meticulously so that you can pull out the right data layer. Another thing is the statistics on the accuracy of these machine learning algorithms that the data scientists like to use can be completely misleading. It's really important to keep the, the subject matter experts involved with the data science team uh, so the data science team doesn't go down some rabbit hole because the numbers look good, but in fact it's not practical. Um, another thing, science instruments for space applications are usually unique, and that is there's no commercial equipment equivalent. This means, ironically, that we have not enough data to train on prior to the mission. After the mission, we have too much. Before the mission, not enough. A um, couple things to do that. Make an early prototype that generates flight-like data. Very early and a plan to use that to, to generate a good set of data for, for machine learning. Or you could design the instrument to be compatible with a commercial instrument. Um, something to really take it uh, into account in advance. Um, third, unlike most machine Earth-based machine learning projects, we don't know what we're looking for. I, I mentioned this early earlier. The Nobel Prize might be in the anomalous data. It might be the outlier. Uh, it might be something we've never seen before. We want to make sure the AI doesn't throw that out. Um, less important on Earth applications and discovery missions like space research. Uh, it's, this is key. Uh, so the I would develop a the uh, algorithms as the instruments being developed and establish like a trust readiness level so that the, the scientists learn to trust it uh, and include anomalies and outliers in the test plan. Okay, so quick conclusions 
AI is going to be required, essential for, for the future of uh, space applications. And uh, the prototype showed some key things that everyone's going to have to worry about. Uh, address machine early, machine learning early in development. Uh, include the science team and data science together. Uh, and make sure you include anomaly detection and have that baked into your testing plan. Okay, thank you very much.